Thanks, David. I, I want to start firstly by, by uh, thanking David for inviting me here and also to acknowledge the National Groundwater Association that's, that's funding my travel to about 40 or so uh, venues uh, this year. Just a couple of words about the Darcy Lecture Scheme. It, it began in uh, 1986 with uh, John Cherry, who was the first Darcy speaker, and it's provided an opportunity for people to travel around and talk about some of the results of their work. Um, it, originally it was a, a North American scheme, but then in the early 1990s it was Ed Siddiqui that, that took the tour overseas and went to Europe, and we've been very fortunate for a number of years also in having Darcy lecturers come to Australia and talk to us, so it's become much more of an international scheme, and I think a very valuable opportunity to share the results of, 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 uh, of our work. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is to talk to you a little bit about some of the aspects of the work that we've been working on, looking at the use of environmental traces in hydrogeology. I've subtitled the talk Reducing Uncertainty in Groundwater Flow because I think that's an area where environmental traces have a particular application. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about exactly what I mean by environmental traces uh, a little bit later on, but I guess for, for the purposes of the moment, let's just say we're using chemistry to find out about groundwater flow. And before I get going, I want to give you just a little bit of a context in hydrogeology in Australia and, and give you an idea of where we're coming from. Because there's a couple of, different, couple of different things about hydrology in Australia which give us a slightly different emphasis. Firstly, the land mass of Australia is almost exactly the same as the land mass of the US, but we only have 20 million people, so very low population density. Secondly, uh, very low rainfall. So issues of groundwater contamination are less of an issue in Australia than they are in North America and also in Europe. So we're focused more on, on groundwater quantity and that's been even more important in the last five years or so with a serious drought we've been going through. So our work is looking at groundwater availability, groundwater supply, less of an issue on groundwater contamination. As I talk to you this afternoon about some of our work, I'd like you to think about the accuracy with which we could do prediction in hydrogeology. And while, okay, we can't achieve the type of precision that engineers are required when they build bridges, still, as water becomes a more and more valuable commodity, the onus is on us to provide more and more accurate, more and more reliable predictions. So I'd like you to keep that in the back of your mind and think about whether our predictions are accurate enough. So by way of an outline first, I'll start off with a little bit of a historical background. So talk to you about the origin of hydrogeology and the origin of traces in hydrogeology. I then would like to climb the ladder of complexity, if you like. So we'll start talking about simple systems, simple homogeneous aquifers. I then want to move up, talk about more complicated, talk about how traces behave in heterogeneous systems move up another layer, talk about fractured rocks and how we can use traces to understand movement, water movement in these most complicated systems. And we'll finish off perhaps with some conclusions and with a little bit of ideas of, of what I think maybe some of the future directions are, some of the ways we should be moving. So okay, most people would be aware that not so much the origins of hydrogeology, but the origins of quantitative hydrogeology are usually traced back to Henry Darcy. And Darcy, as we know, observed a linear relationship between the flow of water through a sand column and the difference in pressure between the upstream and downstream ends of that column. What most people don't realise, of course, is that Darcy actually never named this constant proportionality. He wasn't particularly interested in it. He just observed a linear relationship. And yet this constant, the hydraulic conductivity, has become the focus of a lot of what we do in hydrogeology and still is today. Probably for about most of the 100 years after Darcy, we're really focused then on trying to estimate values for hydraulic conductivity so that we could use Darcy's law in the field, measure heads, measure pressures, measure hydraulic conductivities, use Darcy's law to estimate groundwater flow rates, groundwater velocities. And by perhaps the middle of the 20th century, we'd pretty much decided, uh, arrived at pumping tests or aquifer tests as the most routine, useful tool for estimating field scale values of hydraulic conductivity. Groundwater flow models are really no more than a means for solving Darcy's law in three dimensions and automating that process while preserving water balance. Groundwater flow models, though, are the, are the main tool of groundwater managers today in making predictions. Well, there is another way. If you want to know how fast a river's flowing, 
you could measure the, the slope of water in the river, measure the height of the river at the upstream and downstream ends. You could measure the hydraulic resistance of the river sediments and do a hydraulic calculation of the river flow rate. You could do that. Or you could throw a stick in the river. And all right, sticks aren't particularly useful in hydrogeology, but we have a number of traces that serve the same purpose. And this area of work also incidentally really began in France towards the end of the 19th century when people started putting dyes, putting salt solutions in ground and in, in groundwater and seeing how fast they move. It pretty quickly became apparent though while these applied traces or injected traces as we call them are a very useful tool in certain areas of, of groundwater studies, they were never going to become the useful routine tool for estimating groundwater flow rates. Groundwater just doesn't move fast enough. Okay, we're talking about metres per year sometimes. So if we put, it, put our dye in the groundwater here, we come back three months later, see where it's gone, it's right where we put it. So it was never going to be a useful routine tool. The next big step forward was again in the middle of the 20th century with the explosion of environmental traces. So three things happened within a short period of time. Firstly, radioactive carbon-14 was discovered. Uh, carbon-14, which we use to date bones in archaeology, we can also use it to date water because carbonate salts are dissolved in water. The second thing that happened is that radioactive tritium was discovered. Tritium is the radioactive form of hydrogen, the radioactive isotope of hydrogen. Hydrogen is part of the water molecule. So we have radioactive water. And this guy here pictured on the left, Willard Libby, is perhaps one of the founders for this area of work. He won the Nobel Prize in 1960 for discovering carbon-14 and was also one of the first to point out the hydrological applications for tritium as a tracer. So carbon-14 was discovered, tritium was discovered. The third thing that happened is that very large concentrations of these and a whole range of other chemicals were injected into the atmosphere through thermonuclear testing. And these have provided traces for us to use since that time. So an environmental tracer, if you like, is, is any compound that we measure in groundwater that we use to tell us about groundwater flow processes that we didn't deliberately put there ourselves for that purpose. Okay, they're not necessarily natural, but they're traces that we didn't put there for that specific purpose. <clears throat> okay, so we have a whole range of different environmental traces and they can be used for looking at sources of water, looking at chemical reaction rates. The ones that I want to focus on today are that subset of environmental traces that are used that give us information on time, tell us about groundwater ages, and hence can be really useful for estimating groundwater velocities. And these fall into two main groups. So the group here on the top right are what we might call event markers. Now these are substances whose concentration in the atmosphere has varied over time, but it's varied in a well-known way. So we know how the concentration's changed over time. And I'll just point out a couple of these to you. So it's tritium here, 3H is tritium in the dark green. Huge concentrations of tritium in the atmosphere in the 1950s and 1960s because of thermonuclear testing. The other one I'll point out to you that I'll talk a bit about today are the chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. Now we hear about chlorofluorocarbons through their effect on the ozone layer. They're gases, but they dissolve in water, and we could measure the concentration of water, of, of CFCs in water, and say something about the age of the water. So this is, for one particular CFC, this is CFC 12, is the brown curve here. And essentially, if we measure the concentration of that in water, we can read off that graph, and it tells us the age of the water, or more exactly, when was the last time that water was in contact with the atmosphere. Now, the other group of traces that give us time information are what we might call the radioactive decay-based methods. Now, these are substances whose concentration in the atmosphere has been relatively constant in time, but they have an inbuilt clock. They're radioactive. And so, again, they provide time information. The concentration declines exponentially with time in the groundwater. The most common of these is carbon-14. Carbon-14 has got a half-life of about 5,700 years, so it's useful for dating water over time scales from a perhaps 200 up to 20,000, 20, maybe 30,000 years. Okay, well, knowing the age of groundwater was interesting, but it wasn't particularly useful. 
until we realise firstly that, okay, if I know the time that you start a race and the time that you finish a 100 metre race, I know how fast you're running. And in the same way, if I can work out the age of the water at one upstream well and the age of, a wa of the water at a downstream well, I know how fast the water's moving. So this was starting to be a little more useful. The next thing that happened is, and this is work of Ericsson and others in the late 1950s, we developed, and this is before we had groundwater models. This is before the era of the numerical models we have today. When people developed these highly idealised aquifer models, rectangular models, triangular aquifers, uniform recharge, uniform hydraulic conductivity. And the point of these is with these highly idealised systems, we could calculate essentially on the back of the envelope what the distribution of water age was like everywhere in this system. So here, the blue line shows the flow line in this simple rectangular aquifer system. The red lines are what contours of equal age look like. And the equation isn't particularly important, but the point is the age of water at any point in that system is a function of things like the aquifer thickness H, the porosity, the recharge rate. What that meant was that suddenly we could turn that equation around. If we could estimate the water age at any point in that system, and we knew the porosity and the aquifer thickness, we could calculate things like aquifer recharge rates. And suddenly this was really useful because the recharge rate is one of the most important things for estimating sustainability of aquifers. How does the pumping rate compare with the aquifer recharge rate? So groundwater aid started to be a whole lot more useful. And from a couple of measurements of groundwater aid in an aquifer, we could potentially estimate aquifer recharge rates. Let me give you just a couple of studies. This is one of the early ones. This is one of the first studies that used carbon-14 to estimate groundwater ages and groundwater flow rates. So this is work of Pearson and White back in the 60s. This is the Carrizo sand aquifer in Texas. So the outcrop area is the stippled area up here. And the water moves down in a confined aquifer through this system. The numbers in red are the ages of the groundwater that they measured with carbon-14. And so you can see in the outcrop area, the water is less than 100 years old. As it moves down through the system, it gets older to be more than 25,000 years further down the aquifer system. And in the bottom right here, we've just got a plot of age versus distance from the outcrop area. You can see it pretty much a straight line. The slope of that line is the water velocity. And if we assume a particular, this is a confined aquifer, square confined aquifer model, we assume a particular model, we can do some calculations and calculate things like what the recharge rate to that aquifer is in the outcrop area. Really useful things hydrologically. I'll give you just one more example. This is some work that I was involved with going back to uh, when I did my postdoc, when as a young Australian having come to, come to Canada to do a postdoc and never seen snow before, they gave me the keys to a car and, and gave me a map and sent me north to uh, collect some groundwater samples from in the snow. This is Sturgeon Falls, uh, a couple of hours north of uh, Toronto. And if you look, the, the, the tent was, was, this was new to me because uh, the tent is to, of course, to, not to stop the, high, the, the Australian hydrogeologists from getting cold. The tent is to stop the water from freezing when you pump it to the surface. So there's a little heater going inside the tent. And if you look closely, you can see a, a line of iron pipes here. Each of these pipes goes down to a different depth in the aquifer. So we could collect a number of water samples and sample this aquifer very discreetly and look at how the age of the water, uh, how the water got older as we went deeper. This is the data over here. And so every one of these blue dots represents a measurement on one of these iron pipes. We measured the CFC concentration. From that, we calculate the age of the water. And that's what's shown here. We can see the water gets older as it gets deeper, and it does so in approximately a linear way. Again, the slope of that line is the vertical water velocity. If we know the porosity, we've got the aquifer recharge rate. Well, there are a couple of problems, I guess, with, with those methods. Firstly, aquifers aren't squares, aquifers aren't rectangles, aquifers aren't triangles. They don't have constant hydraulic conductivity, they don't necessarily have constant recharge. However, you can do all of that now with today's numerical models. Models like ModFlow, will calculate for you what the distribution of groundwater age is right throughout the aquifer system. So what that means, if you, if you, you calibrate your model with heads and hydraulic conductivities and ask the model what the age is around that system,